Aloha! This is Dr. Tiki, writing a prescription for tiki drinks, tattoos, and tech. What could be more fun? It's time for another Strange Love Live. This is Strange Love After Hours. I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening and welcome back to Strange Love Live After Hours. I'm your very live and going on right now host, Cami Chaos. And as always, I'm joined by Dr. Normal, who is also live and present right now. Hello, live streamer <laughs> chat room people. Additionally, we have the very live and present Abraham Hyatt. <laughs> How are you doing on this lovely Friday evening? I'm doing very good. And... <laughs> <laughs> We're all very lively. It's, it's Friday. <laughs> it's it's, it's after a, hours. It's been an incredibly long week. Phew, I'm glad I made it through that long week. Why are you so far from the mic? I'm Am I really it. that far from the microphone? Yeah. You... It's because it's Friday and I'm tired because it's so late at night. And I'm just kind of slumping away from it. I'll try to pretend okay. it's Tuesday at 8. Okay. Tuesday at 8, I could probably sit up straight and be close to the microphone. Yeah, we're having a lot of audio problem, problems this Friday. Hey, you know, I think that the... Well, actually, I don't know. I wasn't wearing my headphones. I thought the tech episode went smoothly. How did it go? Yeah, it was good. Except for your... I screwed up your mic once or twice. That's your fault, not mine. Yeah, I know. That, that is on Friday, July 24th. On Friday, July 24th. Should we tell them the secret? No. Okay. We lie. There's no secret. Podcasts can lie. Journalists Podcasts can't. Podcasts are liars. That's why he's not saying much. He's a journalist. He has to no, tell the truth. Did, did you introduce him? Yeah? I did. Oh, okay. I did. He just didn't say much because he doesn't want to lie <laughs> about the fact that it's Friday the 24th at 11 o'clock at night. Yes. Ish. Late at night. Late. And Late. look at the Very chat late. room go. <laughs> My goodness. Could you guys just behave yourselves? <laughs> They want to know about your tattoo. That's what they're asking. What they're That's saying right. is, Cammy never has other tattooed people on the show. She's always the only person with tattoos, except for those crazy people who ask her how much it hurt, and then she kicks what them in the nose. What a great lead-in. That was awesome. Yeah. I'm just going with yeah. the really, really funny before we started recording stuff. Yeah. It's not funny anymore. No, it's good. It's good. What about those tattoos? Go! <laughs> um... <laughs> Hours is harder than the tech episode. Yeah, I know. You get sprung on stuff. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of work on my arm. That's about it. Well, working. So, projects. what is the meaning behind the large black blocks? Uh, I like how they look. I think that the negative space. I like that I'm not lines. the only person who can answer that <laughs> that mm-hmm. way. Is there some significant meaning behind your tattoos? Yes. I wanted tattoos, yes. and those were the ones that I liked. Exactly. Why are they all black? Because I don't like color very much. Exactly. Well, that was a riveting conversation. <laughs> yeah. I don't really have much to add. It mm-hmm. took a long time. Mm-hmm. And it felt really nice. Felt like great. Like puppies and kittens and marshmallows. And yeah, getting your elbow <laughs> tattooed is really enjoyable. Yeah, I've never Ouch. had my elbow tattooed. Ouch. Ouch. I don't know that I'll ever get my elbow tattooed. I've known guys with full sleeves. That didn't have their elbows yeah. tattooed. So that's some pretty... Well, one of the hard things is that it's... You have to uh, tattoo it again and again and again. And so mm-hmm. the, the elbow, there's, there's parts Ouch. of it that are tattooed like five times. Mm-hmm. There's big sections of it. Now, do you have this. it 
and and you guys can just all deal with this. This is technical information I need. Did they tattoo it bent or straight? Oh, bent. bent. Like That's this. what I figured. So it stretches it. out, and then when it heals, it puckers. Yeah. So if you think about it, you know, you're tattooing something that's that big mm-hmm. that really, you know, doesn't look like it's very big at all. Yeah, that's so the it just thing takes with forever. With skin, any place that the skin is flexible, they have to pull it. For, if you don't know about tattoos, they pull it tighter so they can get a nice smooth line when they're tattooing you. Yeah, they. Uh, I think we added up at the very end that this top part was, I think, 24, 25 hours. Yeah. Um, wow. So it's... You which is know your tattooer. Which you know. is about equal to, to the amount of time that was spent on my back, I think. So, in hmm. a big giant block. Yeah. As opposed to my entire back on the spine, which didn't feel good. Do you want to take your uh, top off no. there and show the uh, <laughs> live streaming If you'd like to see what my naked back room. tattoo looks like, you can go buy the Get Naked for a Cause calendar. Oh, good point. Ha-ha. Do we have that? Oh, we don't even have it it's down upstairs. here. It's upstairs. Doggone it. No, seriously. I that See? Fantastic promotional Would you like to lip, lift up your skirt and um, answer the question whether or not you're a tranny for the chat room? I'm sorry, I'm just <laughs> is going the, to... Is the chat room asking if I'm a tranny again? <laughs> We've had some problems with that. Oh no, I think Verso there, just shut it down. There's some disbelief over whether or not I was going to be fun. born a woman. Um, yeah, Verso is working hard this evening, and so are we. Yes. I think... So part of that statement was very true. That's right. I, I can see into the current present, and Verso's working very hard. Right. In present danger? <laughs> oh, I never joke. saw that movie. Oh, uh, don't. <sighs> you know, I stopped watching things with Harrison Ford in them after, after the whole Indiana Jones. I stopped watching things with Harrison Ford after the whole Star Wars. You know what was sad, though? I did watch. I finally watched. We've discussed this before, and it still pains me. I watched that last Indiana Jones movie. I haven't even seen it. Don't watch it. Don't. Have you seen it? No. It's don't. So, hey, it sounded pretty bad. bad. Don't watch it. Just don't watch it. It's... Oh. You know, I shouldn't use the <laughs> profanity required to tell you what a bad movie that one was. It sucked. It was bad. I, I have used the profanity required and on this show before to tell you how bad that movie was, but I don't want to give it any more airtime. Yeah. So when you're not being a journalist <laughs> or a digital journalist or getting tattooed, what are you doing? Um, the last couple months I've been doing the conference, literally. Yeah. That's been, been camping down in Northern California once, on the Oregon coast once. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's the only fun things I've done recently. Uh, I have been very, very boring. So you're really looking forward to the journalism camp and probably to like seven o'clock that night. Yeah. August 2nd is a real, it's a real star on my calendar. Um, I mean, I love it. This is really fun and it's really cool, but oh man. It's a lot of work. Yeah. it's, It's for someone who has never put on a conference before, I mean, you have to make all the dumb mistakes, Mm -hmm. you know, and you go, oh, I didn't know that, you know, so. Did you just think he was going to be like, yeah, I'm going to throw a party. Yeah, I was like, oh, you just call up a bunch of, you know, smart people, see if they want to come talk, you know. Mm -hmm. Sounds easy enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's probably the easy part. It's all the other, no? That was actually even the hardest part. Really? Yeah. Wrangling people has been a remarkable uh yeah, uh, it's educational. See, I think that's educational. what a conference is. I would never, people. ever, ever, and I repeat, ever put on a conference because I don't think it's a very well disguised fact that I don't like people very don't, much. Don't ever say never. Individual. That's a good point. Individual persons I can deal with, and that's yeah. that's fine. A person, fine. A small group of people, okay. But when you talk about people as a whole and what's involved in dealing with them, I just kind of check out. Yeah, I, it's not my. You say after doing a couple major conferences in the last I was coddled. couple months. Let's I mean, face we did it. our own thing. Let's we did the Strange it. of Life thing. Yeah, we did the two conferences, and, and, and we they had were great fun. People helping and we had us great out. people working with us, and I yeah. was coddled the entire way, except for the one day that literally I didn't get to eat lunch yeah. until way late in the day, and I finally stopped and I said, I need to eat lunch now. And I was really mean, and then I believe I tried to headbutt somebody. Yeah. I mean, it was somebody that I, I know and love. And right. 
she said you can't do that but if you're in con- <laughs> see I'm not a people person I'm not I don't do big social things but if you're in control mm-hmm. it's so much easier you know like I'm not the kind of person to go up and like talk to strangers but like that's what I did as a reporter you right. know yeah. but right. if you're the one in control then it, for some reason it's a lot easier it's like I can't like go to a party like I can't go you know chit chat make small talk but yeah. I can walk into a room for like if I'm doing some, you know, working on some story and go talk to people, you know. It's the same way. So, if I'm doing something yeah. for Strange of Live, I can go ahead and go and talk to somebody and be in front of people and walk up to anyone and be fine. But otherwise, right. I would prefer to sit in the corner of the room. Yeah. I'm nice. Well, <laughs> I know that journalists don't like this, but it's it's performance at, it at some level. I mean, um, you know. Well, it's a persona. Having played music in the past and sometimes... Now, you know, you get up on stage and essentially the moment you get up on stage, you're expected to do something and that's what you do, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's like doing it's your job. It's just a less formal stage. Um, right. And um, I think, you know, I know Stephanie Strickland will get pissed. Hi, Stephanie. But I, I think get that, pissed at Mike now. You know, I mean, you know, journalists aside, you got to be on TV and you... you to be on. You gotta be on, you know. And why it's would she be upset about that? Well, she she made that comment once about I, I can't if remember. If she said something so we, to you in private, then don't. Just... No, it was on the <laughs> no, it was on the podcast. Oh, okay, that's fine. Then. As long as it was something she said. Performance or being a performer, and she mm-hmm. said, "I hate it when they call us." A oh no, no, no! Yeah. What she said is she hates it when they call her the talent. Oh, talent. Right. Yeah, and yeah. that that's different than being a performer. There's a big difference because hey. being called hey, the talent. Cammy. Never mind. Okay. Yeah, being called the talent <laughs> is kind of insulting. In in a certain way, if you get called the talent, it's That's like, oh, never mind them. Give them give them some mineral water and let them sit down because they're pretty and you don't so want to I worry totally them. I totally screwed that up. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so, Abraham, tattoos. No, we did that already. So, how's your website going there? Uh, yeah, it's going. Thinking. What do you do on your website? On abrahamhyatt.com. I do. Um, I am. You know, everyone says like, "Oh, you should have like a specific like focus or goal for your website," and I'm terrible at that. Mm-hmm. I do. Um, I write about journalism. I just wrote a post um, that earlier this week about how I looked at 130 years worth of journalism, and I picked out some examples of. Things that digital journalists could look at to remember that what they're doing is not so unique. You know, mm-hmm. there's some really good lessons from the very, very distant past, um, and that's uh, gotten some some great interest. I, I've been waiting for someone to write something like that up because this isn't the the first time. I mean, when you look at it's the march of technology. What what are some of the examples? Just some that come to mind. Oh, it goes all the way back to. You know, Stephen Crane writing in the 1890s this um, piece about, uh, this is the slice of life, about a guy and his son walking along on a street, and the guy falls down, has what sounds like an epileptic seizure, and this really gawking, leering crowd gathers. And he just stood off to one side and, and, you know, recorded it. Uh, And, uh, you know, stylistically, would we probably do it differently now? Yeah, probably. But what he was doing, the reporting techniques he was using, is really no different than what we're doing now. Um, there was a, you know, one of the examples I used was, you know, voice. You know, a lot of journalists, you know, try to use this, you know, some big voice, some crazy, you know, big sounding <laughs> voice. And it, the point that I make there is that, like, there's a few dozen people who've done it well over the last, you know, 50 years, you know. Or, or, excuse me, 150 years, you know, something like that. Go back and look at the masters, you know. Look at the people who've done it really well, who've actually been able to pull it off. Um, and do your homework. Learn from them. Um, do, you have a, do you have a problem with uh, journalists who are either on camera or on mic now? I, I know I, I ask. It's a loaded question because I notice that when I listen to podcasters, especially tech podcasters from the Valley, and some pretty well-educated people, half the time I can't stand their voice. And I can't, a, a lot of the uh, network news, I can't stand the voice. You know, I mean, Walter Cronkite just died, right? When he'd get on and start reading the news, you you 
you had this feeling. You stopped and you listened and you yeah. paid attention. But it was natural. It, it, well, it was unnatural, I think. I mean, those guys talked funny at the end of the day. <laughs> they right? talked funny. Have a mic. But didn't, don't you think it had sort of a natural resonance to it? Yeah, that there was something yeah. that you like just fell into naturally as a listener? It's whereas, a rhythm, yeah. too. Now the rhythm is like if you're listening to a tech podcast, it's somebody going... Well, you know, you know, because they're like from yeah. Valley and hey, stuff. And I have like, a tech Ooh. podcast. Yeah, and actually, I don't talk like that. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I think I think you do a pretty good job of talking like that. No. <laughs> okay, good, because you and I, we were gonna have some. No, words I, I later. told you that before. I, it's I, yeah. I, I mean, just like to hear nice things conversation, about myself. But okay. still, it's but, hard though. I mean, because another thing that I do is I do a little podcast very very infrequently lately on. Uh, on journalism, on what journalists... It was originally started off as what just, you know interesting stories that journalists were writing about. What's the name of the people. podcast? Or is, you just it's go called the Oregon Understory. Oregon, Oregon Understory. 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 Okay. Uh, is it up on iTunes? It's up on iTunes as okay. well. Okay. And, and, and my, if you listen to my first one, oh man, my voice... It's terrible because it's, it's this sort of reflexive thing that you feel like you have to kind of hide behind. At least for me, as, as a total... Somebody who's never come... At that, you know, I element think I'm before. I'm a podcaster now. It's like, yes, now, well, now I need I'm to talk a certain talk like way this. and like act. Just you know, it's kind of like you're. You know, it's put the on Oregon the understory with yeah. Abraham Hyatt. You, you know what you do? It's terrible. You get up in the mic and pretend you're talking to a, uh, you know, somebody in a bar. You know, <laughs> hey. You pretend you're hanging with somebody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, how you doing? So the. Uh, Journalism podcast. No, right. that's like the Johnny I Fever know. podcast. <laughs> I love Johnny Fever, though. I love those guys. I grew up with those guys. The FM guys. WKRP right? in Cincinnati. I mean, I grew up... That's the other thing with radio. You know, I grew up with the album-oriented FM radio guys. You know, Kink, KGON. You know, and these guys would talk for like... You know, less than five minutes and then put on a half a side of Leonard Skinner and go smoke dope, you know. <laughs> and then they come back and go, oh, uh, sorry. So where does radio come into the whole journalism picture? <laughs> Bringing us back around. No, actually, I was just curious about that for real. Because I was reading, see, this goes to, like, podcasting, radio, blogging, and journalism. Because I was thinking about the Read Write Web article that I read this morning yeah. Oh, yeah. that Great. you tweeted from um, Marshall, yeah. from Marshall Kirkpatrick about the application for the iPhone, um, the the public radio application. Yeah. Well, I think what that is, like, it's this incredibly, you know, you know, Apologies to OPB. I mean, I think that they're just as guilty of it as a lot of other uh, public radio stations. They get these great, you know, um, pieces of journalism, Mm -hmm. and they just stick them on the website, you know, and wait for people to come and listen to them. And they're just really missing a lot of the interactivity that needs to exist. It's one of the things that NPR has gotten really, really well. I mean, Mm -hmm. you look at their web interface has been, it has its share of faults, but that's been really, really good about creating um, interaction, not just dialogue, but just, like, play back and forth. Yeah. Um, I think that's where radio's got to go. Well, it can't just be radio. It can't just be on the radio waves anymore. You have to have yeah. multiple ways. People have really become... It's the TiVo generation, and not just for television, for radio, for internet. It's on-demand entertainment right. and on-demand knowledge. They want it when they're ready to, to accept yeah. it. And I thought that that app was a really, really smooth way to go because it not only... I downloaded it, and I haven't had a chance to play with it yet, it gives you the listings for what's going on, but it has some on-demand content yeah. as well. Yeah. And I'm I'm just really excited to play with it, and that's what made me start thinking about where is a radio going with the news. Well, I think another thing that is remarkable when you look at This American Life, when you look at Radio Lab, you're also seeing that radio is uh, it, the opportunities for long-form journalism, for really beautiful, in-depth storytelling, mm-hmm. have gotten... Um, larger and larger. I mean, yes, okay, the funding at you know, individual stations is, you know, they're having a hard time. Yeah. That aside, the opportunities and the technology that allow that kind of stuff to be built, you know, print journalism at, at newspapers, whether it's online or in a print product, you're not seeing long, you know, newspaper pieces anymore. This mm-hmm. doesn't exist. Um, radio, it's still, you know, you know, audio, it's still happening. 
I remember those exposés when I was a kid, or even more seeing stories about those exposés, where someone would crack some, like, crucial piece of information, and then, like, week to week, there'd be, like, more that came yeah. out about it. And no, now it's like, you have everything, now here it is. Yeah. Or if it's on the internet, you have everything, and okay, well, here's a little bit, and an hour later, you have right. more. Exactly. But with the radio... It still pulls you in and engages you, yeah. just like it. You, I mean, people before the television, when they'd sit around and it was their news and their entertainment, and they could just sit around and listen to it. It seems to me that radio can still have that draw, if it can just get out to enough people. Yeah, it's like you said, the magic. You know, I mean, the print had a certain kind of magic, and radio has a certain kind of magic, and you know, radio because of just its audio waves. You know, you don't, you're not just stuck with radio you can do a lot more with it print it was print you mm-hmm. know when, once we lost and we you know we're losing the the daily newspapers it's still going to exist in terms of you know you, you know uh, news magazines and you know weekly newspapers and stuff like that we're not going to completely see print disappear um but yeah i think radio's got that it's the yeah well, it's also such a clean transition. It can, can be a clean transition because a lot of radio shows that have done really well in the past have now just been releasing as podcasts as well. Right. And that's a really, really easy transition for them to make. You're already creating this audio file. Why not just right. spread it around and give people an, another way to listen to it? Yeah, that's how I listen to most of my NPR. Yeah. You know? I, I think that's how a lot of people listen to NPR. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, the whole thing is. Um, I think the interesting thing is that this technology has been around for a very long time. Um, you know, in the inter- internet years. I mean, mm-hmm. I was playing around with Shoutcast in the mid to late '90s um, with early DSL. The difference is the audience is there now. Everyone has a wireless laptop. Everyone has um, a portable music player, well, typically an iPod. Well, and you know, but even outside of the United States, people have mobile flo- phones. That we they had that discussion. Uh, There's not a lot of computers, but there are a lot. But they of have mobile, mobile devices, devices, and they can download content. Um, first, it was audio, and now it's video. So, I mean, all those shows that you're not, you're at work, and you're not you know, able to tune in the radio and listen to, radio seems to have gravitated to that quite easily. Specifically, um, uh, the NPR type radio, I noticed, you know, there were a few holdouts, I think Terry Gross and a couple, but I think they're all now on iTunes, you know, those major national shows. And um, I think, you know, The question is, will print journalism make that move as well? Like, is it the Kindle? Is it the iPhone? What is it? Well, aren't there already newspapers that have subscriptions on the Kindle? Yeah, you can get Wall Street Journal and you can get all the big names. Yeah. So they're making the jump already. And it's Wall Street Journal, so it's a paid I would imagine it would come with your, yeah, because it's all subscription-based. All the ones. There are magazines as well. I mean, there aren't there? Well, but the Kindle is black and white, remember? It doesn't look that great. Yeah, yeah but text. it depends on the kind of... Ma- I mean, you're not going to get a fashion magazine on the Kindle, but... Well, a 1890s fashion magazine, maybe. I don't cha-cha, know. cha cha Which would kind of be cool. Get the old uh, Monkey Ward catalog or Sears catalog on your Kindle. 1898. Mm-hmm. That'll do you really well there, Dr. Normal. Okay. I yeah. Know. You know, print doesn't have the... You know, you'd think, oh, the web is a perfect medium. You know, it's... Perfect for text, you know, what a great way to transition, just like audio has been able to transition onto, you know, the com- computer interface. Uh, but for whatever reason, you can't, there's still no sustainable models for creating revenue for that. Right. You know, that's right. the hard part that, you know, you. Now, this is also, there are other reasons. There is something tangible and. There's something very sensory about picking up a book or a magazine or a newspaper and holding on to it. And I know that people, you wind up in the, you know, not for journalism, but uh, there's a parade in our neighborhood every year. And there was one year that the that our entire family was photographed in the parade. And we've got like 10 copies of that newspaper because we're like, oh, look, we could 
could get that photo and scan I think we've it. Got one right here. Right? Yeah, is that the is that the actual copy or is that some other ring? Uh, or it, I think it's a picture of me playing in the park. So, yeah, same thing. So I mean, there's just something about having that that isn't quite the same as bookmarking it online. Yeah. And we're talking about the uh, Selwood, Selwood B, B. Yeah. which is a uh, local newspaper. It's actually owned by the Pamplin Media oh, Group, Pamplin group. Yeah. now, I believe. Um, and I picked this up down by the Aladdin, the uh, Southeast Examiner. I've yeah. never read that and one. These are all very hyper, hyper, hyper local. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this one's been around for years yeah. and years, too. It's good to see those around. But, but those are monthly magazines, or monthly newspapers, aren't they? Well, I know that yeah. the, the cell would be is a monthly newspaper. Yeah, I believe so. And we were talking about Cornelius uh, yeah. Swart um, with, the, uh, with the Sentinel, yeah. Sentinel, which is a very popular paper. But you know what these guys are, are finding, and I don't know specifically about Cornelius, but I know that there are other examples where, you know, they really want to transition onto the web. Um, and you have these weekly papers, um, you know, who who have this, you know, hey, you know, we've got we've got all this great content, you know, let's put it online. But what they're finding is that still, you know, 90, 80% of their revenue is coming from this print product, you know. And so it's something that you can't hold on to for very much longer, but that's, that's what's keeping you afloat. Um, so... I, I don't imagine seeing, you know, hyperlocal community, you know, journalism like that. Those actual physical papers disappearing anytime soon because, you know, I'm sure they are suffering as much as anybody else is, you know, right now with the downturn. Um, but I do know that niche publications in some regards are, are and I, I have seen some numbers, I and I can't quote where I've got them from, so I've seen them from, but I do know there are some numbers that show that niche publications are staying ahead of, are keeping their heads afloat just a little bit more than anybody else because they have that you know ability to really target a, a specific advertising base. Well, uh, also, I think people tend to get emotional. Like a large newspaper that feeds an entire metropolitan area, you don't have an emotional connection with it. Right. But if it's your neighborhood newspaper and it's something yeah. that you know you open and it up and you pictures see of you and your, your friends Halloween and family, costumes. yeah, we all know if you put a picture of me in it, I'll look. Well, the overhead but for these little so papers is extremely low too. You know, they're, they're, they've been around for a long time. Some of their staff writers have been you know, doing this forever. You know, I mean, you know, we're not looking at like you know Oregonian style overhead for you know reporting and you know research mm-hmm. and copy mm-hmm. staff and da, 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 so. And they do have a user generated. You know, someone takes a picture of an yeah. accident in the neighborhood mm-hmm. or something, and you know where to find the editor. They all have email now. Mm-hmm. You can email it in. I, I I think that will, or that seems to all translate well to the web. Um, I think I think the difference is the multimedia piece, mm-hmm. where you know you have the paper, but you know do these guys do a weekly neighborhood podcast? You know, even if it's just audio or something. I'm surprised mm-hmm. that people that uh, editors of these. Um, local neighborhood newspapers aren't exploring those ideas on their websites. Yeah. I think that there are, you know, there's all these different ideas, these little ideas of, you know, well, you know, nonprofit, you know, um, you know, business could, you know, do just investigative stuff like ProPublica is doing on a national basis. And, you know, in the tiny neighborhood, you know, um, you, you know, level, it would be one of these guys. And I, you know, I, I do think that there is, it's going to be market driven in a lot of ways, in which there, wherever there is a market, there is going to be a small niche publication. This is eventually, we're going to get to that situation. I, I, to me, it seems like we're headed in that, um, um, on that trajectory. The question is, is what's falling in between the gaps? You know, who's, you know, actually spending time in City Hall, you know, you know, looking at, you know the you know, public works department and what's going on in the public works department. You know, where's the? Is there? There's not a market for that. You know, there's a market for you know sports. There's a market for business news. There's a market for you know you know neighborhood news. Mm-hmm. But you know, as we begin to fragment, as we begin to shift this all into all these different pieces of the puzzle, there's going to be holes um, that ostensibly used to be filled by the Oregonian or whatever large market you know news organization. Um, and I don't know. I don't know what the the answer is for that. So. I, well, I think that 
you know, part of the problem is that, um, you know, journalism has sort of been um, kind of uh, made somewhat impotent by the large corporate entities that have taken them over. Um, you know, when I was growing up, a little kid, there was real investigative journalism. Um, and now you have, especially in the TV space, you have, you, have you know, crap on the TV. Well, but you have large corporate entities. GE owns NBC. So do you think you will ever see, do you really believe that on an NBC owned property that you're going to see an investigative piece on a G product. You know what I think, Like though? a jet engine or something like that. There's a famous example, and it used to be that different corporate corporate entities would use diff, would own news outlets and then go after each other. I think there was a famous uh, piece by uh, uh, 60 Minutes many, many years ago about the F-16 which was uh, a GE um, product. I mean, there, there was some, some issues with some wire harnesses and stuff. And so 60 Minutes was ha- went after them, and then I think they bought NBC, and they went after, you know, the CBS properties, right? The, the, the folks who owned them at the time. Um and it just seems like there's a sense we're not getting that. We're maybe getting it at a local blogging level, that there's actually it's bloggers. they don't have something to lose. Exactly. But and I they're think... going to the city council, and they're questioning things that are happening, but they're not answering to a higher power. So the question is, do aggregators then become the new source for knowledge? Because they have the ability to go and pull information from so many different sources. But I think the right. thing with TV is the major networks, it doesn't even matter anymore because it's all entertainment-based. Even the news is entertainment-based right. news. Right. So when you're looking at the major news networks... Or as we like to call it, and now time for some real news. And, correct. You know, it's Britney not Spears so, I mean, or So much whatever, of even the Michael major Jackson. news networks, how many of them were uh, broadcasting Michael Jackson's funeral when there was actual news to be covered? Right. I mean... It's they cater to the ratings and, and they and cater to what people want to see and not and information. A, that a good example need. because I listen to podcasts because I don't. <laughs> I, this whole swine flu things got me questioning a lot of things that are going on right now, and you just don't see that. You read these articles in mainstream media, and it's like, oh yeah, you know, the swine flu. It's an epidemic. Uh, we all need shots. Go. You know, and it's like, wait a minute here. <laughs> I don't see people dropping dead in the streets. Hasn't it killed less people than the normal flu? Oh, oh I... By far, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. but if you read the major news outlets right now, the government's ramping up for the outbreak and everyone's like going to the get their shots. All of a and you're like, <laughs> that's kind of scary when you're talking about, well, you know, maybe some states will force your kid to get a shot before they walk into school. And you're, you're, you're hearing this from bloggers and podcasters questioning this, but the mainstream media, it's, it's tougher, tougher to get that message. And that scares me a little bit because the, you know, the, the newspapers, the journalists are the folks that I would expect number one to be digging down in that investigation, asking experts saying, What's really going on here? You know, is this really an epidemic? Uh, what are we dealing with? I don't know. And on that note, and good that night, note. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> or else, uh, I struck dumb for a moment. I know, Abraham, do you, do you <laughs> well, I think it's. Give, As Michael rips the new asshole to the entire think. media in general. Yeah. No, I mean, give me an example of where you think. Um, as a journalist, where you think journalism has really failed right now? Oh, how much time fair. do we have? Can, <laughs> can we keep going to the extent of three-hour version? <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, have, the, we have eleven more minutes. Oh, uh, we can't wait to get to journalism <laughs> camp. Yeah, right. Asshole, <laughs> yeah. get out of here. The three of us alone. Right? Exactly. You know, They're I mean, gonna lock us in a room and be like, uh, "I don't right. want to hear from you. <laughs> exactly. This is not good." 
it's uh, yeah i mean you can look around and there's a you know million ways it's failing you know and most of them are i think can be traced to you know several different things you know one of them a sedentary mindset that feels like the news organization is the purveyor of all things good and let everyone come and you know and, drink and that's from the our audience fountain. fault too that is the reader's fault as well. But I think that traditionally readers didn't know they had an option. They didn't. You know, if you think about 1980s, really? something like that, you mean, where else would you go? I mean, we, I think a lot, we, I mean, I was a kid then, but I think if you looked at the sort of relationship, it was like, okay, yeah, they did know what they were talking about. And as time has changed, readers are going, wait a minute, we've got well, wait, all these options for news. I also think that when I was growing up watching the news um, and and reading the news, and I remember doing reports, and you cut things out to do your reports, and you watch the news, and you get the information. And it was all very... Was that Creative Commons? It was all very... <laughs> I probably broke the law on a lot of my reports, because I had to have those big boards full of oh, pictures. No. And I didn't credit Aaron Hockley. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, but no, my point is, is that it was so impartial at that point that they really did try to present the news without any spin on it. And now I can't watch the news on. I, I don't think it was that impartial. I just think that there it was were more presented. Voices. It was present. I think it was. Imp- I would think it was there, presented more impartially yeah. then than it is now because now you can watch. And I'm not going to name any names, but there's one station that you can watch, and you can absolutely depend on them to give you the most right wing bias that they possibly can. And that's the way that that station is going to be. That's the way that one network is going to present the news. There's a complete bias. There's a complete spin on on certain things just being presented as oh, I, evil. I think I think all the cable news networks are that way, one way or the other. Correct. They're growing that, that way. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. One way or the other, you can't you can't actually find any uh, visual outlet, any television outlet that's not skewed one way or the we other. We used to have, what was it called? Uh, and new, I mean, news, I actually do think that newspapers, because there's more voices and, and at least the, you have to read for the voice, you have to read for the personality of the individual involved, and you're not looking at the hair and makeup, uh, that you stand a better chance at, at finding something that's presented in a, Mm-hmm. That the person maybe is being more accountable for what they're saying than trying to just be an entertainer. Maybe mm-hmm. that's where I'm going. Maybe what I'm saying is when I watch the news on the television, which I don't do anymore because we got rid of cable, I'm watching entertainers. And to all those who are enjoying our show on cable TV right now, <laughs> thank you very much. Cable is awesome and wonderful. Valley Community Cami access. Chaos doesn't Shout like out. anybody. Shout if you think that I like you. Watching You're wrong. Right now. I hate everybody. <laughs> I am a 90-year-old curmudgeon, okay? See, we, we, we'll bite the hand that feeds us. We just don't care. We're on the internet. You know what? We're crazy. Crazy. I can cool. say this because we have no sponsors. Right. And no one's paying me to say anything. And the moment we have a sponsor, we'll clam up. You know, and be like, oh, yeah. We no, no. I mean, I think that there's... I even crankier. I think broadcast <laughs> news <laughs> is, a, is a beast in and of itself. I mean, I, I really think that that, in some ways, you'd have to just take that as a standalone thing. Because what they're doing on, you know, yeah. regular nightly news, you know, on local channels is is a, is an entity that I don't... I don't really know how to respond to um, mm-hmm. because it is so, it's very formulaic. It's very, you know, obviously people find some something out of it because advertisers are going there and they're well, it self, you know, it's generating something. But we're talking about the failure of journalism. Let's talk about like what the New York Times has screwed up. Let's talk about what <laughs> our local newspapers have screwed up. You know, let's talk about like there's a, to me, there seems to be a different level of accountability that we have. Um, you know, and I'm, and I don't know, come across as a jerk and like put everybody in broadcast news down, you know, but I do think these are two very, very different beasts, I think. I don't know. But I don't want to go with it from there, but I will make that the, the <laughs> But I want to say it yeah, anyway. I, will say. I don't think that's necessarily true on the internet, though. I think on the internet, it's a big mishmash of multimedia. You know what, you, though? I think you have your um, blog and you have your podcast right. that you're doing there. So it. The t- it's not necessarily tools. Yes, broadcast and print media were two different, um, you know, infrastructures that went their merry way. Right. But on the internet, it all comes. It together. all comes back together again. Yeah. yeah. But exactly. On the internet, you still have to deal with the large amount of ego that can be involved. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, you're always going to deal with that, though. 
Right. Yeah, but then in, on the internet, the one thing that I find interesting is that it it uh, gets territorial pissing matches. True. It, does it remind Abraham? Does it remind you of like the early days of journalism and newspapers a little bit? Like as Cammy says, the early pissing matches and and egos. I mean the Walter Winchells. Like yeah, I mean you go back to you know the Hearst, the, you know the Hearst yeah. Wars and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it was very very opinionated. I mean you go back to the you know the 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 founding fathers. You know I mean the the Federalist you know newspapers that were back yeah. then. I mean they were just you know attacking each other. And I actually talked about this at Ignite a couple of years ago or a year ago that. The idea that a extremely partisan press is actually good for democracy. I mean, it actually it stirs debate. You know, it, it has a role. You know, clearly it shouldn't be the only thing there. And so I don't, you know, you look at Fox News and you go, well, yeah, I mean, that's what Fox News is. You look at, you know, CNBC or, you know, MSNBC. You, you, you look at these different cable shows and what they're turning into over the last decade. And, and in some ways I just go, yeah, well, that's, there's really nothing wrong with that. I just want to make sure that we're finding places to replace that, and we're not right now. You know, we are failing to do that, and that's, you know, we're desperately looking for stuff. And you know, I'm very clearly, you know, more print focused than a lot of you know other people. Could, you know, you guys follow the the broadcast stuff more than I do, probably. Mm-hmm. But does. you know, it's you know, on the print side, they're it's just scrambling, you know, trying to catch up. And I mean, it's going to be like that for a while. That's what this conference is. That's why people want to go to this conference is because people are just like looking for little handholds to learn a little bit more and to, you know, to crawl forward. Uh, but print isn't going to be print. I mean, it's well, going to be... The, it's I think be print a, is always going to be print. I think there will always be some form... I think there will no, always be some form of print. That's not Because when we kill print entirely, then we'll have the underground movement it, that will bring print back. It's not my point. My point is that it's um, the journalist is uh, doing print, doing some podcasting, some audio, maybe a little video as well. You know, it doesn't mean they have to. It's just my point is that, you know, all those tools will be part of the, you know, it, it appear in the toolbox of the journalist. That's a good point. They need everything now. I mean, it, it, you know, newspaper people carry around a recorder to record interviews and then trans- transcribe yeah. them back. Right, the internet allows you to transcribe that, uh, to give your opinion, and then post the whole interview on on the web. And not just that, take other elements from the reporting that you've done, public records, documents that mm-hmm. you've gotten, mm-hmm. and take them and turn them into something, put them into an online database. You know that your you know that your media company has that's accessible for you know people to come and use and, and download stuff or is something you try to use as a value added and you know you turn that into something you sell i don't you know i mean there's a lot of different ideas of but it all comes back to that thing of us like learning how to rethink what you do you know i don't just write stories you know and i mean it took me a long time to figure this out i don't just write stories you know i that what i can do with those talents is really multifaceted and it goes all over the place and I don't think there are, I mean, you, I think a great example of like the Oregonian doing it really well is you look at their election coverage, you know, they've got like a designer like uh, Mark, I think his last name is Friesen, um, he's on Twitter, uh, who's doing these like beautiful, like interactive live maps of the night, you know, as election results come in, you've got their lead political guy whose name is escaping me, you know, and he's coming on and doing video updates, you know, every little while, you know, I mean, it's like, I was following the Oregonian for state stuff, you know, I mean, they did a really, really good job, and it was really getting out of the print mindset, you know, really getting into right. the, a different mindset, and, you know, Moving they... towards multimedia. Very multimedia, very interactive, very, hand like, I mean, it was fun, it was like, wow, man, I'm, I'm getting inundated <laughs> with information, this is really cool, you know? You know, I, I I wish that they could do that in, in, in other ways, and I know that they are hampered by many things, um... But it's really, really hard. I mean, people who spend a long time in print, and this is myself included, you get this tunnel vision in which it's like, this is how you do it, you know? And to get an entire news staff and a massive publication to suddenly think differently, Mm -hmm. you know? And these are people who've been in, you know, the news business for generations, you know, is... 
it makes sense to us because we deal with it online. We're seeing it happening. We're seeing it happening live. We're seeing the interaction. But it just doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Um, and I think if you talk about one of the failings of you know big journalism is that these companies are not being proactive in terms of internally creating change. Um, you know, they, they're very well-intentioned people. Don't get me wrong. You know, mm-hmm. like, yeah, we really want to do these different things, but they don't get that it requires more than simply like, well, okay, now we're going to podcast, you know, and that's it. That's going to save, you know, our, our, you know, our journalism right. organization. You can't just jump and say, oh, we've done this, but now yep. this is the answer. Yeah. Now this is the answer. Now podcasting is where it's going to be. It's like, no, 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 you don't get it. So. And so what you were talking about earlier in terms of having the this mindset of it's okay to fail, you know, mm-hmm. but we're used to doing that online. It's like, ah, that, that blog was a bad idea, you know, yeah. you know, like that blog post was a really bad idea. How many bloggers can and, say that? But it doesn't it's go, okay, like, that's the interesting thing about the internet. Your feelings don't magically go away. Yeah. They're there forever for everyone to see. But we feel really comfortable with that. Yeah. You know, or we feel, let me see, we feel comfortable with that. We feel more comfortable I with that comfortable than with our, that. like, <laughs> traditional journalism, you know, you know, fellows. You know, because that, you know, man, you, like, put out a bad issue, you know, like, you typos, you know. I worked as an editor, you know. I used to be married to a copy editor, you know, like, the idea of a typo is just like the end of the world. Like, you know, major <laughs> typo. Online, you just... Fix oh, it. dude, there's a typo. You know, it's like, yeah, it's like, you don't even think, like, like oh, I'm, I'm take care of that. You know, and so it's the ability to fail, the, the willingness to fail is a terrifying thing if you're not used to it. Well, I, I, I think like it's, failure. I think it's the audience, too. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah. the audience is willing to, they actually want to watch you grow yeah. into the role. Yeah. Um, it, well, the internet wants to love people and it wants to hate people. Yeah, but, but and it can a, learn to love you if it hated you. That's a broadcast mentality, and it's almost like a salesman mentality. Everything's slick, everything's perfect, out of the shoot. And I think younger generations sense that, and they sense that they're getting uh, sold. And there's something. a great rejection of that. Right. Yeah. I mean, how, you, we all, come on, you all feel this in the room when you watch something slick, like a like a slick news program. You're like, whoa, yeah. what's this? You know, it's just like watch, watching a car ad or something. And um, if the internet, internet is a little bit uh, more, uh, I don't know, has some more rough edges and you're kind of willing to buy into this person for whether a while it's honest or not it seems more honest right, is what you're right. saying well you, you see people gaming it to make it look you know make it look rough like rough edges when it yeah. really isn't um but there are a lot of people and like that and you get this sort of sense of authenticity hopefully hopefully not a pseudo sense of authenticity you know, I gotta stop you there. We have to wrap it up, but I have one question that I, I have been wanting to ask um, someone on the journalism front, and I keep it keeps slipping my mind. But as a journalist, what do you think of wikis? Because it's a piece of information that's out there, and it's not one person that's responsible for it. It's so many people that can change it, and if enough people say this is, you know, if enough people lie about it, it's up there for people. And you go and you find it, and oh you take that as gospel because it's it's in writing it must be true i think they're fascinating in terms of uh, them being a tool for an, a news organization to interact with the public mm-hmm. um there's a couple um, um i should say that i love the wiki <laughs> go about us his name uh, daniel you, i can never this remember how to say his last name about us <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly three years old and he he's got this great idea of of how they could be used in terms of this interactive ongoing database between that reporters would be using to enter their information from their stories and their mm-hmm. notes um, so it wouldn't be something that would be published but it would be something that the community could come in and be like oh wait a minute no 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 you've got that wrong and and there would be an editing system in place with the the news organization um, but it could create this like Suddenly, your notes aren't just like something you keep in a drawer, but it's something that is that you can have a conversation over. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of flaws in, in how that could get out of hand, and you know, da 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 da. But you know, I think that a wiki, you know, if you're using it to publish information, I just don't think that works. 
Yeah. You know, they just there's just doesn't have this. I don't know. Uh, as a repository for for information, though, um, it seems like a really interesting thing. I don't know. That's my thoughts. All right. Well, I, think I like it. On that note, it's time to wrap up the show. Next week, we're going to have an encore episode, but the week after that, we'll be joined by Rick Trozzi, the Silicon Florist, to celebrate his second birthday with the Silicon Florist. Thank you all. I'm not ready yet. Oh, I thought that was the yay, I'm no, ready. No, Good job giving me a stop, heads up. Stop. Cammy, stretch it out. Let's talk some more. That's what I was. Oh, oh, I'm no, sorry. No, this is the. Yeah, yeah. Is this a, you know what? Pointing at me is good. That means I'm ready to go. A, a couple this things. This is stretch it out. A couple things is we didn't do drinks. Okay. And I have not had any camera time because I've been so fascinated with the uh, with the conversation. Which Would you is like some concern. camera time? Yeah. So so okay. why don't we do drinks and then wrap it up? Okay. <laughs> so now this is this is how we're. You guys are all aware. Fail. You saw that, right? I taught Doctor Normal that this is stretch it out. <laughs> uh, and you know if what? he points I, at me, it means I can like, wrap the show up. I'm gonna reference. Uh, I'm gonna reference this uh, this episode. Uh, right now, mm-hmm. um, hey, there I am. How you doing? Ooh. You can always um, tell he's on camera when he puts his sunglasses. That's right, because it's 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 he's bright. He's the prima donna of the show. Everyone thinks it's me, but it's him. <laughs> it, it's my it's my brand, man. Um, do I have a brand? Yes. Okay. Uh, I should look into that. Did we want to do drinks, or do we, should we just wrap this? We can. I don't care. Wrap this up. You know, they're going to be like, oh, look, think? Cammy's drinking a martini. It must be a dirty dry Bombay martini. Wait, 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 I got the music here. No, no. We don't need the music. Yeah. I, for, you know what? For water. And it does no a, good for me anymore because I can't hear the music in I, studio I feel, anymore. So I don't feel it. I feel <laughs> we... I feel we cheapen the guest if we don't do the drink music because I feel that... He'll but he doesn't away. get to hear the drink music. It doesn't matter. Someone will say, someone will say, hey, oh, Abraham, Abraham what were you drinking? Music. What was the drink music? And will, they didn't do drink music on the on the show I was on. It wasn't on. a real episode of After Hours. They must have pre-recorded it. They must have pre-recorded it. Starting at 7 o'clock on a Tuesday. No. Damn no, them. Never, never that do that before our audience. We're live right now. I'll prove it. Someone just called me a tranny in the chat room. <laughs> okay, so we're Doo-doo. yeah, we're Cammy and I had a martini for after hours. It was very very good. And had water. Abraham had water. <laughs> uh, there's nothing wrong with that water. It's like midnight. And we, and we've got great water <laughs> on here. Friday. We've got great water here in, in Portland. God, we're killing. Actually, time. our so water comes from the water dispenser. Which Who knows comes from where Portland. it really comes from? Comes from the new seasons, probably. So, uh, Abraham, just uh, quickly, tell us what you see uh, the future of journalism in the next 50 years. Go. <laughs> it takes him a well, while to get his goal set up, doesn't it? To begin. It? <laughs> uh, it's going to be a hell of a lot of fun. That's good. That's good. I, you, you, the one thing I did that I was curious about, and that is that... Um, we're talking about the internet and all this stuff and user generated. There's a lot of noise in that as well. Yeah. And I think for me, for me, I could see where journalists, journalists can come in and, and help with that, you know, to Mm -hmm. edit it, you know, I mean, rather than, you know, I've got 50 million YouTube videos, what's important here or are any of these important? Yeah. And, you know, I don't think a lot of people are talking about it because, Journalism is a two-way street, right? It's the readers and the reporters. Yeah, I mean, the analyzers are always where the money is, you know, or where the not where the money is, where the value is, you know. That's why magazines, you know, are worth more in terms of ad space than newspapers, because it's smart people sitting down and, you know, actually analyzing the information. And I think that there's going to be huge value in that online, and that's a question. But I have no clue. <clears throat> is, that, is that partly because of the release? You get a magazine once a month, and you have time to pour over the entire thing, whereas a newspaper, you toss it out yeah, and get a new one every the day. caliber, too, of like what you're getting. You know, this mm-hmm. this analysis piece, you know, really some time and energy and thought went into it. You know, a lot of work went into it. When you read a New Yorker piece, you know, you're like, 
man, that's that was money well spent, you know. But, you know what I bought that uh, you know magazine for. Whereas you're not getting, and, and there's no, I'm not putting one down or the other. You know, what you see on the, you know, your, you know, the AP feed or something is completely different. You know, it's just what's happening now. Da 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 da. I, th- there has always been inherently less value in that daily. And somebody's probably going to contact me now and tell me that I'm, no. my, I'm totally wrong on this. But I'm, from what it appears to me, it's just the ad structure has always been that magazines get to charge a crap load more money because what they have is worth more. It would seem that now, especially, that would make even more sense because yeah. the price of magazines is not that much higher than the price. I mean, three days of newspaper is about what you pay for a magazine, isn't it? Well, I meant more the advertising. No, rate. well, no, but I'm saying from a from an end user perspective, oh, right. for what I'm getting out of yeah. it, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, how much are newspapers? Are they like seventy five cents a dollar now? Dollar now, yeah. Yeah, so a dollar a day for a newspaper or two fifty on Sunday. You can get a magazine for like three fifty. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think that that role of the analyzer, that role of the you know cruncher of information, and then you know that's what the, all the good blogs are. Mm-hmm. You know, you know that's why you that's why you read Marshall. You know, it's because it's like oh, it's a really interesting take on that. You know, yeah. that's why we read Rick. You know, it's these mm-hmm. people who take the noise and condense it down into something good. Did you write for RPDX? I, I did. I technically yes. You do, or yeah, you I did? do. Okay. I haven't written for them in a long time. Because when I said I said no, I haven't met Abraham. Mike I was like, "What? Well, you guys write for the same blog?" And I was like, "I don't know if he writes for the blog anymore." And let's be fair, I don't really write for it. I post episodes of Strange of Five on it, and every once in a while, I write a post because I, I should. I have some great ideas for posts, and I've just been so busy with this whole conferencing that I haven't even had time to touch it. So you hear that, Betsy? After the conference, he's gonna write a post. Yes, I made hey. him say it. That's true. Hey, I have no problem saying that. Before we roll out here, we should uh, plug the conference one more time. We should. Website, uh, journalpdx.wordpress.com. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's on Saturday, August 1st from 9.30 to 4. You need to sign up by the 30th. The 30th. Which is only in a couple days. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's just a couple days from now. It's very soon. It's on Thursday. Which is less than a week from now, That's or right. more, depending on whether or not you bought my load of bullshit. <laughs> well, with that, <laughs> with that, join us next week for an encore episode. The week after that, to celebrate Rick Rosie's Silicon Florist uh, second anniversary. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you so much, Abraham. Thank you. Thanks Thank you. Guys. you.